Warning, this film contains content that some viewers might find distressing. Viewer discretion is advised. While the RMS Titanic disaster is the most famous shipwreck that comes to mind when we think about ships that went down at sea, there was a far deadlier event which killed almost nine times the people on board. This is the story of the MV Wilhelm Gustloff, a ship that was desperately overcrowded with desperate people fleeing a war zone. Greetings and welcome to Frozen Time. I'm Catherine of Sky, and here we relate moments in history that shape the people around them, events which are often dark, disturbing, and tragic. So if that's what you're into, you're in the right place. Please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, it's time to cozy in for a tale that you won't soon forget. Context 1945. 1945 was a year of massive world change. The United States would drop atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and shortly thereafter, World War II finally came to an end after killing an estimated 70 to 80 million people, or about 3% of the entire world's population. Bing Crosby, Nat King Cole, and Glenn Miller were popular musicians of the day, and Alfred Hitchcock's famed movie Spellbound was released, starring Ingrid Bergman and Gregory Peck. Ship Construction The MV Wilhelm Gustloff was constructed by the Blom and Voss shipyards. She measured 208.5 meters long by 23.59 meters wide, and had a capacity of 25,484 gross registered tons. She was launched on May the 5th, 1937. Originally, the ship was intended to be named Adolf Hitler, but instead was christened after Wilhelm Gustloff, leader of the Swiss branch of the Nazi party, a man who had been assassinated by a Jewish medical student in 1936. After sitting next to Gustloff's widow during his memorial service, Adolf Hitler decided on the name change to honor his officer. The ship completed sea trials in the North Sea on the 16th of March, 1938, and after passing, she was handed over to her owners. Cruise Ship The Nazis had created a new organization called Strength Through Joy, Kraft durch Freude, or KDF, and the Wilhelm Gustloff was the first cruise ship purpose-built for that program. She was to provide recreational and cultural activities for German functionaries and workers, including concerts, cruises, and other holiday trips, and to serve as a public relations tool that would present, quote, a more acceptable image of the Third Reich. I find this idea very amusing. Yes, we're subjugating millions of people, we're being racist, bigoted, planning on invading other countries. But hey, here's a fancy cruise ship to take our own on pleasure journeys. That fixes everything, right? Wilhelm Gustloff was the flagship of the KDF cruise fleet until the spring of 1939, which was her last civilian role. On the 24th of March, 1938, the ship made her unofficial maiden voyage. She was carrying Austrians in an attempt to convince them to vote for the annexation of Austria by Germany. On the 29th of March, she departed on her second voyage carrying workers and their families from the Blom and Voss shipyard on a three-day cruise. That's kind of nice. Take the workers who built her and their folks on a celebratory cruise. Good on you. Hero Ship On her third voyage, Wilhelm Gustloff left Hamburg on the 1st of April 1938 under the command of Karl Lübe to join the KDF ships Der Deutsche, Oceania, and Sierra Cordoba on a group cruise of the North Sea. On the 3rd of April, a storm developed with winds up to 100 kilometers per hour that forced the four ships apart. Meanwhile, a short distance away, the English coal freighter Pegaway had also gotten caught up in the storm. The waves tossed the ship around, washing over her decks, sweeping cargo and machinery into the sea. The ship lost maneuverability as the storm increased in intensity. By the next day, she was taking on water and slowly sinking. In the blackness of night at 4 a.m., Captain G.W. Ward of the Pegway issued an SOS when the ship was 20 nautical miles northwest of the island of Terschelling, off the coast of the Netherlands. Wilhelm Gustloff was the closest of the ships that answered the distress call and hastily steamed to Pegway's position, reaching her at 6 a.m. Wilhelm Gustloff launched her lifeboat number one, 
with a crew of 12. Unfortunately, the ore-powered lifeboat was unable to come aside the pegaway in the heavy seas and soon was in danger, needing rescuing herself. Wilhelm Gustloff then lowered lifeboat number six with a crew of 10. This lifeboat had a motor and it was better able to handle the waves. The crew of number six first assisted their shipmates in lifeboat number one to head back toward Wilhelm Gustloff, then motored onward toward the pegaway. One by one, the 19 men on the pegaway jumped into the freezing, inky black sea and were hauled into lifeboat number six. They all arrived at the Wilhelm Gustloff by 7.45 a.m. At this point, a Dutch tugboat arrived but was unable to save the pegaway, which soon rolled to port and sank. Lifeboat number one had been so badly damaged by the waves that after its crew had climbed up via ladders to the safety of their ship, it was set adrift to capsize and sink, only later to be washed up on the shores of Terschelling on the 2nd of May. Floating Voting On the 8th of April 1938, Wilhelm Gustloff departed Hamburg for England, where she anchored 5.6 kilometers offshore from Tilbury so as to remain in international waters. This allowed her to act as a floating voting station for German and Austrian citizens living in England who wished to vote on the approaching plebiscite on Germany's unification with Austria. A plebiscite is the vote by which the people of a political unit determine autonomy or affiliation with another country. During the voyage, 1,172 Germans and 806 Austrian eligible voters were ferried between the docks at Tilbury to the ship where 1,968 votes were cast in favor of the Union and only 10 voted against. Honestly, this seems a bit fishy. Get luxury-starved people on an opulent cruise ship, give them scrumptious free drinks and food, and then ask them to vote in favor of Germany? I imagine that would be very much frowned upon in today's polling places. These days, I think it would amount to vote rigging or bribery, etc. Her official maiden voyage was undertaken between the 21st of April to the 6th of May 1938, when she joined Der Deutsche, Oceania, and Sierra Cordoba on a group cruise to the Madeira Islands. On the second day of her voyage, the 58-year-old Captain Luba died on the bridge from a heart attack. He was replaced by Friedrich Peterson, who commanded Wilhelm Gustloff for the remainder of the cruise. Peterson left the ship until he returned as captain on her final voyage. Condor Legion Delivery Between the end of May and early June 1939, Wilhelm Gustloff was diverted from her pleasure cruises. With seven other ships in the KDF fleet, she transported the Condor Legion back from Spain following the victory of the Nationalist forces under General Francisco Franco in the Spanish Civil War. The Condor Legion was a unit composed of military personnel from the Air Force and Army of Nazi Germany, which served during the Spanish Civil War. The Condor Legion developed methods of strategic bombing which were used widely in the Second World War shortly afterwards. From March 1938 until August 1939, the ship took over 80,000 passengers on a total of 60 voyages all over Europe. Military Service From September 1939 to November 1940, Wilhelm Gustloff changed roles and served as Lazaritz Schiff D, meaning hospital ship. After this stretch of duty, her role was changed again and the medical equipment was removed from the ship. Because of the Allied blockade of the German coastline, she was used as a barracks ship for approximately 1,000 U-boat trainees of the 2nd Submarine Training Division in the port of Gdynia, located near Danzig. Wilhelm Gustloff sat in dock there for over four years. Daily life became routine, and her crew could only dream of the open seas. As the winter of 1941 set in and snow started to collect on top of the piers and warehouses, Small patches of grey paint appeared on the Wilhelm Gustloff between January and February. Ostensibly, these were to test and see which shade of grey would look appropriate on the ship, though it might be camouflage experimentation or possibly. As the sailors continued their training, the Wilhelm Gustloff was soon painted in navy grey from stem to stern. I guess they finally figured out the right colour. Operation Hannibal as the Red Army advanced into Poland and the Baltic states, the German troops and civilians required naval evacuation from Operation Hannibal. Wilhelm Gustloff's final voyage was to evacuate German refugees, military personnel, and technicians from East and West Prussia. Let's take ourselves to that evacuation port. In Gdynia, the scene is panic-laced chaos. Thousands of refugees, mostly women and children, 
are jammed into the harbor, crushing up against each other. There are few men, since those who are able-bodied have already been sent to fight the Russians. Fear-inducing SS stormtroopers are patrolling the crowds to ensure none are sneaking onto the ship to escape their duty. Many people are ill, having endured bitter cold and long distances as they traveled by carriage or on foot in the cruel January winter weather. Thousands fall by the roadside and never make it to the Danzig ports. Unimaginable death litters the roadsides. Despite the mass of people on the docks, boarding the Gustloff is orderly in the early stages. In standard Nazi style, originally people were required to have a ticket just to reach the piers, where the big ships were waiting to carry the refugees. Armed guards patrolled the gangways to keep out those without priority or privilege. The privilege of boarding was first given to U-boat officers, crew members, the Women's Naval Auxiliary, as well as wounded soldiers arriving by train. Next, those with privilege are given passes, those with connections either with family and friends on board or those with local influence. Money also talks and some were able to buy a pass with bribery of the guards and of course we will never know how many of those deals were made. The ship's complement and passenger lists note 6,050 people on board, but these did not include many civilians who boarded the ship without being recorded. Heinz Schön, a German archivist and Guslov survivor, extensively researched the sinking during the 1980s and 90s and concluded that she was carrying a crew of 173 Naval Armed Forces Auxiliaries, 918 officers, 373 female Naval Auxiliary helpers, 162 wounded soldiers, and 8,956 civilians for a total of 10,582 passengers and crew. That's enough people to populate a small city. The ship was meant to hold only 1,900 people, making this a stiflingly overcrowded and claustrophobic city. Besides civilians, the passengers included Gestapo personnel and Nazi officials with their families. The ship was overcrowded, people pressed up against each other, their breath and body heat making it uncomfortably and oppressively warm and humid. Because of this, many passengers defied orders not to remove their life jackets, discarding them to be a tiny bit more comfortable in the stifling heat of the cramped and close quarters of the ship. The ship left Gdynia on the 30th of January 1945, accompanied by the passenger liner Hansa, which was also filled to the brim with civilians and military personnel. They were joined by two torpedo boats for protection. Hansa and one torpedo boat developed mechanical problems and could not continue, leaving Wilhelm Guslov with one torpedo boat escort. The ship had four captains, Wilhelm Guslov's captain, two merchant marine captains, and the captain of the U-boat complement housed on board, and they disagreed on the best course of action to guard against submarine attacks. This seems like a very strange idea to have so many cooks in the kitchen, so to speak. I understand having a military advisor, but why were those other captains in there to argue their points as well? If anyone is knowledgeable about ship procedure or in the Navy, etc., I hope you'll write a comment and let us know if this is normal or advisable. Because looking in from future hindsight, this sounds like a terrible idea to have so many captains on the same bridge. So with all these men arguing for their own plan of action, against the advice of the military commander, Lieutenant Commander Wilhelm Zahn, a submariner who argued for a course in shallow waters close to shore and running in complete darkness, Wilhelm Guslov's captain, Friedrich Peterson, decided to head for deep water, which he knew had been cleared of mines. A mysterious radio message came in, suggesting that an oncoming German minesweeper convoy was sailing right toward them. After hearing this, Peterson decided to activate his ship's red and green navigational lights to make the ship visible so as to avoid a collision in the dark, making Wilhelm Guslov easy to spot at night. The Wilhelm Guslov did not have any protection as a hospital ship under international accords because she had been fitted with anti-aircraft guns, and the Germans did not mark her as a hospital ship, instead having returned to being painted in the traditional naval grey. Hospital ships were to be painted white outside with a horizontal band of green or red, and were to fly the Red Cross flag. The Germans also failed to notify the authorities that she was operating in a hospital ship capacity in that area. This made her a free-for-all target. Prelude to Disaster Wilhelm Guslov was soon sighted by the Soviet submarine S-13 under the command of Captain Alexander Marinesco. The escorting torpedo boat was designed to scan for submarines, but their subsensor had frozen, rendering it inoperable. 
the Wilhelm Gustloff's anti-aircraft guns were equally disabled, leaving the vessels defenseless. Marinesco followed their ships to their starboard seaward side for two hours before deciding to make a daring move to surface his submarine and steer it around the Wilhelm Gustloff's stern in order to attack it from the port side closer to shore where the attack would be less expected. At around 9 p.m. CET, when the vessels were about 16 nautical miles offshore, between Grossendorf and Leba, Marinesco ordered his crew to launch four torpedoes at the Wilhelm Gustloff's port side. As is fairly typical, the commanders sometimes used a war cry, naming their weapons of destruction as they were launched. The first torpedo was nicknamed, For the Motherland! The second, For Leningrad! The third, For the Soviet People! and the fourth for Stalin, though that one got jammed in the torpedo tubes and had to be dismantled instead of being fired. All three successfully fired torpedoes struck the Wilhelm Gustloff on her port side. The first torpedo hit the ship's bow, causing the watertight doors to seal off the area where off-duty crew members were sleeping. Those poor people probably woke in a fright with a huge earthquake-like shaking of the ship, only to find themselves in the dark the freezing water filling the chamber, drowning them in short order. The second torpedo hit the accommodations for the women's naval auxiliary, located in the ship's drained swimming pool. The blast was so severe it ripped the ceramic tiles from the pool walls, shattering them and sending them flying in all directions at high velocity, which caused heavy casualties. Only three of the 373 quartered there survived. The third torpedo was a direct hit on the engine room located amidships, disabling all power and communications. That must have been so terrifying, the lights going out being in complete darkness, attacked with what amounted to grenades in small, confined spaces. Some chambers were flooding as well, needing to climb, climb, climb to the deck to get out of that death trap. That's one of the worst nightmares for me, being in the darkness and water flooding in. It's just horrible to even think about. According to reports, only nine lifeboats were able to be lowered. The rest had frozen in their davits and had to be broken free by sailors working full out. About 20 minutes after the torpedo's impact, the Wilhelm Gustloff listed so dramatically to port that the lifeboats lowered on the high starboard side crashed into the ship's tilting side, destroying many lifeboats and spilling their occupants into the inky black sea. The water temperature in the Baltic Sea at that time of the year is usually around 4 degrees Celsius. That's just above freezing. However, this night was particularly cold, literally freezing, with an air temperature of minus 18 to minus 10 degrees Celsius, and ice flows could be seen covering the surface. Many deaths were caused directly by the torpedoes or by drowning in the onrushing water. Others were crushed to death under the stampede of panicked passengers up the stairs and on the decks. Many others jumped or fell into the icy Baltic Sea. The majority of those who died succumbed to exposure in the bitterly cold water. Sadly, because of the extremely cold temperature, they were unable to hold out for a rescue and soon slipped into unconsciousness, their arms going limp and their bodies slipping deeper into the water as they drowned. Less than 40 minutes after being struck by the torpedoes, the Wilhelm Gustloff was lying on her side, Ten minutes later, she sank bow first into the sea in 44 meters of water. German forces were able to rescue 1,252 of the survivors from the attack. They did so with torpedo boats, minesweepers, a steamer, a freighter, a patrol boat, and a torpedo recovery boat. Unfortunately, 13 of the survivors died later. All four captains on the Wilhelm Gustloff survived the sinking. The only officer to have a naval inquiry started against him was Lieutenant Commander Zahn, the military submarine captain. However, his degree of responsibility was never resolved because of Nazi Germany's collapse in 1945. Numbers equal individual lives. The figures from Shun's research make the loss in the sinking to be 9,343 men, women, and children. His more recent research is backed up by estimates made by an alternative method. In March 2003, the Discovery Channel aired an episode of Unsolved History in which they did a computer analysis of her sinking. Using Maritime Exodus software, it was estimated that 9,600 people died out of more than 10,600 on board. This analysis considered the passenger density based on witnesses' reports and a simulation of escape routes and survivability with the timeline of the sinking. 
The victims were not only Germans, but also Prussians, Lithuanians, Latvians, Poles, Estonians, and Croatians. To give you an idea of perspective, about 10,582 people were packed into a cruise ship that was meant to accommodate only 1,900. And though some on the ship were Nazis, others had been the victims of Nazi aggression. Obviously, this is a massive tragedy, and on the scale of shipwrecks, it far exceeds the most famous of disasters, the sinking of the Titanic, which of course killed around 1,500 people. Why haven't we heard of this? The answer is that the Nazis actively tried to hide news of these disasters, even denying that they ever happened. Aftermath. After the sinking of the ship, thousands of bodies washed up on shore for weeks afterward. Between them, lying on the sand, was found a Madonna, hand-carved from one of the ship's deck planks by someone. I think it's such a precious gift to the memory of those who lost their lives. Obviously, you can't bring the people back, but offering religious comfort so selflessly is a kind and compassionate gesture. During the war, both the Allies and Axis powers sank many ships carrying civilians. However, the tragedy of the Wilhelm Gustloff remains by far the largest loss of life resulting from the sinking of a vessel in maritime history. On the night of the 9th of February, just over a week after the sinking, the same Soviet submarine S-13 sank another German ship, General von Steuben, killing about 4,500 people. Before sinking the Wilhelm Gustloff, the Soviet commander, Captain Marinesco, was facing a court-martial because of his problems with alcohol and for being caught in a brothel while he and his crew were off duty. Marinesco was thus deemed not suitable to be a hero, and instead of gaining the title Hero of the Soviet Union, he was awarded the Lesser Order of the Red Banner. He was downgraded in rank to lieutenant and dishonorably discharged from the Soviet Navy in October 1945. In 1960, Marinesco was reinstated as Captain Third Class and granted a full pension, and in 1963 was given the traditional ceremony due to a captain upon his successful return from a mission. He died three weeks later from cancer at age 50. Marinesco was posthumously named a hero of the Soviet Union by Soviet General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev in 1990. The Wilhelm Gustloff's original destination was Kiel, and Hitler's newest U-boats were waiting for the 900 specially trained sailors on board the ship. These new Type 21 U-boats were considered to be groundbreaking, and many feel that they could have had a significant impact on the outcome of the war. Once they fell into Allied hands, they became the prototype for today's modern submarines. The Wreckage Noted as obstacle number 73 on Polish navigation charts and classified as a war grave, Wilhelm Gustloff rests at the coordinates you see on screen, about 19 nautical miles offshore. It is one of the largest shipwrecks in the Baltic Sea floor and has been attracting much interest from treasure hunters searching for the lost amber room. This was a room decorated floor to ceiling with amber, gilding, carvings, fine furniture, mirrors, and more, and it was dismantled and looted from Catherine Palace near St. Petersburg, Russia. It contained over 6,000 tons of amber and covered over 55 square meters, and the spoils were rumored to have been aboard some of these fleeing German vessels. I have been to Catherine Palace, where they have started a reconstruction of the amber room. And though it is very beautiful, the reconstruction is nowhere near finished because of the high cost of obtaining the amber and paying the craftsmen to work on it. Modern estimates put the value of the original amber room at around 500 million in 2016. The Polish Maritime Office in Gdynia has forbidden diving within a 500 meter radius of the wreck to protect the property on board the war grave as well as the wreck itself and the surrounding environment. Extraordinary facts. How about these coincidences? January 30th, the day the ship sank, was also the day that its namesake, Wilhelm Gustloff, was born in 1895. Also on the 30th of January, Adolf Hitler, the man whose name was originally destined to be on that ship, was appointed Chancellor of Germany in 1933. Dr. Ferdinand Porsche, founder of the car that bears his name and the famous Volkswagen Beetle, originally called the KDF Wagen, participated as a guest during one of the Wilhelm Gustloff's Italian cruises. In an unexpected bit of foreshadowing, there is a link between the Titanic and the Wilhelm Gustloff. In 1943, Hitler's propaganda minister Goebbels decided to commission a movie to be made about the sinking of the Titanic. And while the ship wasn't in the film herself, some of her doomed passengers were. 
Many of the extras involved in the filming were from the 2nd Submarine Training Division on the Wilhelm Gustloff. Thoughts? So what do you think? Would you have opted for a bit more comfort in that hot and humid ship and taken off your life jacket like everybody else? I mean, you're on this massive, unsinkable ship, practically a rock on the ocean. Also, what do you think about the mysterious radio message? Was it a ruse from the enemy? Why didn't any of the four captains think of asking for a security code to verify its veracity? They had one job, am I right? That's the end of our history today. If you got something out of today's episode, please subscribe to the channel, click the bell, and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. If you enjoyed this video, please activate the like button and consider leaving a comment. Both help us grow the channel so we can offer you more histories in this format. If you want to get in touch with me, write to me at the email on the about page or ping me on Discord. And remember to subscribe to our social media channels on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. If you're consuming this episode as a podcast, we'd be very thankful if you left a review since that raises our ratings on the podcast sites and helps people find us. As always, much love to our patrons.